So good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me and I wish you a warm welcome for the third webinar in this Paternos webinar series um, under the title of E-Humanities and E-Heritage Research Infrastructures Beyond Tools. And my guests today are Stephen Krauer and Stefan Schmunk. Um, you can see them already on the screen next to the right. Um, before we start, I will shortly explain um, some housekeeping rules to you and especially how everything works. Um, as you have noted, um, as a participant, uh, you are muted during the webinar and you also cannot be seen only what you submit to the chat. If you have any questions or remarks, uh, you are warmly invited to use the chat to put um, communication uh, to um, all participants. And um, if you have a very special question for the question and answer session at the end, it would be very nice if you indicate it by um, starting with a question word before. Um, we have a lot of time um, or we have time after uh, the presentation to answer your questions. If you have any sound problems, please test your technical settings and you should be able to, um, we have the, the, the speaker symbol um, has to be green that you can hear something. That's all for the housekeeping. And now I first would like to say a few words about Partenos, the Partenos project who um, is hosting uh, the webinar series. Partenos stands for pooling activities, resources, and tools for heritage, e-research, networking, optimization, and synergies. Mainly what is behind this very long title is that Partenos is a Horizon 2020 project that aims to strengthen the cohesion between heritage-related e-research and it does so by having many international partners from the various European countries. Partenos is coordinated by PIN in Italy, and I have said that before, but I mention it again, um, this webinar series is a cross-Partenos training effort. Now you have already heard a bit um, about Partenos. My name is Ulrike Wutke. And now I would really like to know a bit more about you, the participants who are already, I see you. Um, and um, I have prepared a little short answer poll for you, um, just to get to know each other a little bit, where do you come from? So it would be great if you could type a short answer in, um, the poll, so we have a little idea about the geographical spread. Ah, okay. Many answers already coming in. Okay, thank you. And this See, Germany is quite many people from Germany, but I also see Croatia and Ireland and let me see what I see, Sweden, the Netherlands, um, Spain, Budapest, Greece, so Croatia, so wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, thank you for making the time and be here with us today. Um, okay. And then I come to the most important people for today, um, besides all the participants, but uh, I'm very happy uh, that uh, Stephen Krauer and Stefan Schmunk um, are here today as trainers of this webinar. Um, both are experts in the field of 
research infrastructures and just a few words um, about uh, each one of them. Um, Steven is uh, originally um, has a degree in mathematics, you wouldn't think that might be, and also a minor in linguistics. And he has uh, spent uh, very productively most of the time at uh, his time at the Faculty of Humanities of Utrecht. He was the coordinator of um, Clarin EU and even has um, been part of the founding period. And he is now acting as a senior advisor to the Clarin Eric board. So welcome, Stephen. Stefan Schmunk holds a degree in history and political science, and he has a PhD in contemporary history. And he has been the coordinator of uh, Daria DE, so Daria Germany. And um, since 2015, he is of the research and development department of Göttingen State and University Library. So welcome also to Stefan, and that is from me. I gladly hand over to the two of you. Okay, welcome. My name is uh, Stephen Krauer. Since you're all based in Europe, I can really say welcome to you, and uh, I will not be the first speaker in this seminar. It will be my first webinar ever, so it's a very exciting experience for me as well, but I will now hand over to uh, my colleague Stefan to uh, start the introduction of our webinar. Thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Stefan Schmunk. Yeah, it's also my first webinar and uh, Stephen and I are really, um, yeah, we, we're looking forward for today. It's a little bit creepy because we can't see anybody. But anyhow, if you have any questions, you use the chat, please. We want to give you today a short introduction into the topic of research infrastructures uh, in the European landscapes uh, beyond tools that means today we are not talking about tools, but if you have any questions, just ask. Okay. Um, we want to start with a really short prologue because uh, in our opinion, um, re research in science, not only in the arts, the humanities and the cultural heritage, but mostly in general, changed in many ways uh, in the last three decades. And um, I like really much the overview by Jim Cray. Jim Cray is uh, the eScience Group leader of Microsoft and a couple of years ago, around 2010, uh, he set up uh, uh, an overview about the last 2000, about the last 3000 years of science, history of science in one slide. And um, in our opinion, we are at the moment in many ways uh, in the middle of digital transformation of arts and humanities. And uh, at the same time, so we had a lot of changes during the past thousand years in science. And uh, especially after the time of enlightenment in the 17th century, um, science changed in many ways. Before, the most scientists and scholars uh, describe natural phenomena, and uh, after uh, the period of the 17th century, 18th century, um, they thought more about theories and models and tried to generalize uh, the view of the world. And um, at the middle of the 20th century, the era of computers started, and so we had a lot of topics about computerization and simulation of uh, complex phenomena. During the last 20 years, 30 years, and my background, I'm a librarian, uh, we had a lot of changes in science and also a lot of changes in uh, the arts and humanities because science moved really strong and fast to a data-driven science. And we want to give you today an overview about it. And at the same time, the digital transformations of the last three decades changed in many ways the research in the arts and humanities. New digital research methods developed. We are talking not only about literature, books, 
or printed sources. We are talking more and more about digital data and we are talking about larger volumes of digital data, which are the basis for uh, the arts and humanities. And at the same time, we have some changes and major changes uh, in the education and trainings. Scholars in the arts and humanities need new abilities. And uh, we had a lot of changes of curricula and staffing at the universities during the last 10 years. And looking at Germany, um, it started around 2007-2008 that uh, it was suddenly possible to get a degree in digital humanities, for example, or in a digital library. But uh, we are at the beginning of this movement. At the same time, we have a change of theoretical approaches. It's something completely different if you are talking about digital data and the context of digital data uh, compared to a printed book. And uh, the research practices changed in many ways. In the opinion of Stephen and me, uh, the digital turn in the arts and humanities is like a wave. And a lot of people uh, are scared about uh, changes but, um, and challenges, but for us it's more or less an opportunity. And uh, we are the opinions that arts and humanities should drive the wave. And you will see the image today more often. <laughs> okay, what we are planning to do today with you is we investigate how research infrastructures can assist the research process in the social science, arts, humanities, and cultural heritage. That will be our first topic. Um, at the same time, um, which opportunities and challenges I talked about the digital transformations, that means we have at the same time opportunities and challenges for the uh, way how we do research. And the third aspect, um, how stakeholders, how scholars can engage with digital research infrastructures. We want to give you a brief overview about some initiatives on the European level and at the same time on the national, on national levels. And um, yeah, we are looking forward to the discussions. And okay, we'll thank you, Stefan. Well, since we're all researchers, we will, of course, start with the question, what are research infrastructures? Because we, before we can discuss them, we have to, I have to have an idea what they are. And well, we start with a rather formal definition by the Euro, uh, European Commission in some uh, document that they wrote about uh, research infrastructures. I'm not suggesting that research infrastructures have been invented by the European Commission. On the contrary, they existed long, long before uh, the European Commission had been invented. But in their definition, they say that research infrastructures are facilities, resources, and services used by the science community to conduct research and foster innovation. And they include major scientific equipment, resources, such as collections, archives, and scientific data, e-infrastructures, such as data and computing systems, and communication networks. Research infrastructures can be single-sided, just one single resource at a single location, distributed, a network of distributed resources, and they can also be virtual. And this means that the service is provided electronically and there will not be one big building that hosts the whole facility. Very often it's just a collection of computers or uh, data storage places spread over Europe. And um, now, some, if we look at the infrastructures, we all know that um, infrastructures can exist in many different shapes. You have analog infrastructures such as uh, uh, libraries, galleries, uh, archives and museums, but there are also data infrastructures where uh, that give access to, to all sorts of data uh, for different disciplines. And um, they are, uh, the digital and the, the, let's say the analog infrastructure are interesting, interestingly different in one specific way. If you have a, a, a physical infrastructure, an analog one, a big building, they normally have a starting point when they start building the infrastructure and they have a point where the, the infrastructure is ready to be used by the researcher and very often some f five, ten or a hundred years later there's a moment when the thing is closed down. For digital, different, different, digital infrastructures the situation is different 
and um, in that they normally gradually evolve. They start with a small collection of data and they gradually expand, more and more data are added, more and more tools and facilities are added. So these things don't have a very clear starting point, but they are in a, a continuous state of evolution. And um, now we, um, we are actually very proud to say that uh, research infrastructure started in the humanities. So it started with us. And I think that libraries are the, the oldest research infrastructures in the world. And you know, some examples that I found on Wikipedia is the Royal Labor Library of Alexandria. That's, uh, well, some, some uh, uh, two and a half thousand years ago. Um, another one in Mosul, the National Library of France in Paris in the University of Oxford's library since 1602. So they have been in existence for a long, long time. So they are nothing new. And um, what we see, but most of these, these libraries were for, the, let's say, for the soft sciences, for the humanities, for uh, literary studies, for theologists or whatever. And what you see now is that um, in recent times we have started to develop uh, research infrastructures for the hard sciences. So we have uh, particle accelerators, uh, CERN in Geneva is of course the most known example. There are new ocean research vessels, the Polar Stern since 1982, although um, even ships like, like uh, James Cook's Endeavour um, that they used to discover Australia could be uh, called uh, research infrastructure because the purpose of that travel was to investigate the world. And of course we also have the Hubble Space Telescope that has a place somewhere in space since, already since 1990. So there are lots of different types of infrastructures. And uh, in the 1990s you see new trends apart from the physical installations. Uh, we get domain independent computing infrastructures you know, a very well-known example is the, the academic networks throughout Europe that connect us all. And Ed Your Own is a very uh, interesting feature of it that allows us to, to uh, connect to this network wherever we are in, in Europe and even outside Europe in some places. And we have developed domain-specific data infrastructures that collect data and provide data in uh, all disciplines, such as environmental and earth science, sciences, biological medical sciences, energy, material sciences, analytical facilities, physical sciences, mathematics and ICT, and uh, last but not least, social sciences and humanities. And the, uh, now, uh, what about you, before we start discussing, uh, of explaining more about um, the uh, infrastructures? Um, how the question is, and you will see um, uh, a poll on your screen very soon, what exactly is, how would you describe your role in relation to research infrastructures? And we've given a few examples of roles and you can just uh, select one or more of them. You could be, let's say, a student or a researcher who's really using the, the infrastructure as a consumer, but some of you may be uh, providing data or services or tools to the infrastructure. Some of you may be building and operating infrastructures. Some of you are uh, managers of infrastructures. And of course, there are always other people who are not closely related to infrastructure at all, but who are still interested in this um, uh, webinar. So uh, now if I look at the scores, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that uh, there is, seems to be a majority of uh, real users of infrastructures. Because one of our concerns as, um, let's say, research infrastructure owners or, or, or uh, operators is that um, although it's fun making infrastructures and, and making the tools, it's always uh, the question how many users we attract that really want to use our infrastructure. Because I think it's only if the users use the infrastructure that it makes sense to, to spend our time and spend tax base money on uh, building and exploiting the infrastructures. So I'm, I'm really very, very pleasantly surprised. So. Now that we know who we are, I think uh, we can um, close the poll for now. And I would like to hand over to Stefan, who uh, is going to tell us what we in social science, humanities and uh, cultural heritage expect from research infrastructures. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you all, because uh, we, we, we talked um, in the phase of preparation for the webinar during the last weeks 
uh, a lot about this audience of research infrastructures and uh, Stephen and I had the impression during the last years that often the real users of the infrastructures are not uh, the main group of active uh, partners uh, because on the slide we prepared here, um, it's a definition from the Wissenschaftsrat in Germany from the year 2011. What uh, it's a high political organization, and um, they gave a definition about uh, research infrastructures in the social sciences and humanities and cultural heritage. And um, at the same point, uh, it was the starting point in Germany. Um, to discuss um, how research infrastructures for the arts and humanities should be built. And uh, they give two aspects, uh, two points, um, why it's needed. And uh, first, they say, okay, research infrastructures can improve the working conditions, uh, e.g. in terms of access to scientific information, so data or publications. Um, and uh, second, um, the discussion and development of research uh, infrastructures are important to uh, handle in new ways, concrete research processes, uh, projects and to um, develop new tools and uh, uh, software products to analyze data. And so you see uh, the interests and the main focus of the normal audience and the user could be a little bit different. Let me jump on the European level. As I said, on, in Germany, it started around 2009, 2010. Definition came from 2011. On the European level, the discussion about research infrastructure started around 2002. And uh, the European Commission uh, founded ESRI, European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. And um, they decided that uh, research infrastructures, not only for the arts and humanities, for the whole disciplinary bandwidth uh, in the European research area, would be important uh, to be developed. And um, at the moment, we have around 50 European research infrastructures in the, whole, in the whole broad variety of disciplines coming from energy, environment, health, food, physical science, engineering, social and cultural innovation. And Stephen has shown you three of them like uh, CERN um, or like the Polarstern. And um, you can find some additional and further information uh, on the website of the European Union. Um, by the way, we put all the links in the presentation so you can use it after the webinar to get more and further information. The really important aspect at this point is when we are talking about research infrastructures on a European level, it's always a consortium of national uh, partners. So you have not only one host uh, in one country, it's always a network of scholars and scientists across over Europe uh, who are participating on this research infrastructure. Um, coming back to the arts humanities and cultural heritage, at the moment we have six uh, research infrastructures. So let me start with uh, Chester, um, then Clarin and Daria. Clarin and Daria will be presented later on. Um, a new one is ERIES, European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, and for Social Science, European Social Software and SHARE. Additionally to these six research infrastructures, we have a bundle um, of European research projects. Um, and the six we mentioned here on the slide are uh, only uh, an example for a really, really broad variety of different research projects uh, on the European level. ERI is, for example, 
uh, research infrastructure for European uh, for Holocaust studies and uh, a lot of local and national institutions and scholars and scientists are working collaboratively uh, on the question how data and sources from the uh, area of the national socialism um, could be made accessible for the research. And uh, yeah, if you want to, to know more, you can click later on um, on the links. And um, our question is always, and uh, it's an elementary aspect for the development process of uh, research infrastructures, how research infrastructures can assist the research process. And um, so I will hand over to Stephen at this point. Okay, thank you. Because I think uh, many people uh, may think that uh, research infrastructure of the types we are discussing, the, the, the ones with uh, fill, filled with data, uh, 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 can only assist the research process by uh, offering uh, files of data and uh, a bag of tools to, to, to process the data. But there is a lot more that uh, research infrastructures have to offer to the research community and uh, we are going to, to illustrate this on the basis of a few examples. Um, for, before we can do this, we have to, to realize that the research process is uh, the process that uh, consists of stages, different stages, um, and that uh, in each of them you will see that the research infrastructure can play a different role, can uh, provide different support to the uh, researchers. And um, we, the, the, to, to uh, distinguish the, the phases of the research uh, process, we will adopt the research life cycle that has been um, adopted by the Partners Project. Um, but there, there are lots of other, let's say, competing models of the research process, but this, this one was very convenient for us because of its simplicity. Um, I would like to, to emphasize that uh, when we are using the term research process all, all the time, uh, we interpret it in a very, very broad sense because we know that um, the research infrastructure are not just serving those who uh, are doing research and who want to make an academic career and uh, write lots and lots of books and uh, uh, articles and papers and become famous. Um, our users are also people working in cultural heritage institutions where their main objective, that's what they are being paid for, is not to write academic papers, but to, to improve the quality of a collection and the way it's documented, preserved and presented, etc., etc. So we very explicitly include this category of users, even if we keep saying researchers for the sake of simplicity. Now, um, as I said, I mean, we're going to, to show the partners model. If you do a search on Google for research life cycle, you will see a variety of different pictures, you know, very, very big ones and very nice and elegant ones. And um, But we've, as I said, we've adopted the one that uh, Partners is using because it's a fairly simple model that uh, can help us to illustrate the usefulness of infrastructure, research infrastructures at various stages. Now, the model is this one. You see, it starts at uh, developing the research question, then planning the research project, carrying out research, uh, analyzing data, and then publishing the results. And of course, um, there is, uh, we put it in the middle, also the, the issue of training, because for many of the activities, you need some training and support in order to be able to um, perform them properly. Um, I think in the, in the ideal picture, I would have liked to see an arrow coming in from the left and uh, just uh, touching the circle uh, uh, at the point where uh, developing the research, research question starts because that would be uh, the, the phase where students are trained in order to become researchers. So first you get your training, then when you've got your degree or your diploma, or whatever, you start developing research questions. So then you end up in this carousel and there you will probably spend the rest of your career turning in uh, circles that are getting more and more exciting, everything you uh, start on a new question. Now, let's see. Um, we are going to illustrate this on the basis of two research infrastructures, as Stefan already mentioned, uh, Clarin and Daria. You will see that they are, although they are 
um, uh, both research infrastructure for the social science, social sciences and humanities and uh, cultural heritage, they operate in very different way and they have a very different focus. Um, I will now hand over for to, to Stefan, who will tell us everything about Daria. Not everything, only a few aspects of Daria and Clary. Um, as you know, we, we are coming both from the Daria or Clarion perspective, so it was really close to us that we use both initiatives as examples for today. And um, you find further information on Daria EU, but the most important aspect is that we are not only talking about um, technical components of um, an infrastructure, because in our understanding, an infrastructure um, is always set up with the minimum of four components. And we are talking about teaching, training, classes, courses. We are talking about research data. I think research data is always an important aspect because um, we have a difference um, compared to printed uh, sources or books if you're using digital or digitized data um, because you, you need a broader methodological background to analyze and to make it usable. And um, so the area, for example, is collecting best practices for metadata and standardized exchange of data, is developing ontologies, and um, one elementary question, not only for the art and humanities, is always how you can find your data. And um, so the question of make data citable, referable, and findable is a really important aspect. So teaching research data are two components. Uh, research is, in our opinion, the most important aspect of research infrastructures because uh, we are not building a bridge or a highway and uh, we are in the middle of a research process if we're talking about digital research infrastructures because we are, don't know at the moment how a research infrastructure could run for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And our goal is to make data accessible, to make uh, data citable and um, so we are in the middle of a research field and this research field has to be organized uh, collaboratively and interdisciplinary. And last but not least, um, the fourth task of activity in the area context is uh, the area of technical infrastructures because you, you need a technical background to develop tools or to make, make data citable and so on. But uh, anyhow, Daria is by researchers for researchers and it's an architecture of participa participation. Um, that means that everybody could participate on this network and everybody is able to integrate their own research results and their own ideas and developments into this network. Um, coming back to the research circle, um, we have different phases and I just want to, to give you a brief overview so that you can find a lot of information uh, about this single step, starting, for example, with uh, Daria Teach. It's a collection of courses and uh, online material going over to uh, uh, digital Humanities Bibliography, um, which is uh, hosted by Daria in Germany, but at the same time more than 150 scholars worldwide are working on, and um, so on and so on. And on the left side you see two examples for repository and publishing results. Uh, one is a HAL archive, uh, it's a French repository. Uh, which is used in the art and humanities European-wide and the other one uh, is a new kind of uh, publishing research results uh, with the name of Daria Working Papers. It's a service from Daria in Germany. 
and I will hand over again to Thank you, Stefan. I will very briefly uh, give some, some highlights of the Clarion infrastructure. Clarion stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, also serving the, the specifically the humanities, so, social sciences, humanities, and cultural heritage uh, community, but also others. Um, Clarion is about language and um, language in all its modalities, just not, uh, not just the written text, but also uh, ancient inscriptions, manuscripts, um, modern text, movies, audio, video recordings, um, the people uh, the, who use sign language and uh, web content, or whatever uh, has a con an element of language is interesting and relevant for us. Uh, Contrary to, to Daria, which uh, Stefan described as a, a sort of community of researchers, we see uh, ourselves in Clarion as a community of uh, repositories, data and uh, tools repositories in, at this moment, 22 countries. And they have as their common goal to make uh, digital language resources and tools and expertise available to scholars, researchers and students, or whoever wants to um, uh, study something where language plays a role. And now, um, you, some of you might think, well, this is going to be about linguistics and I'm not a linguist, so I'll just get, a, get up and have a cup of coffee. But you should realize that language is everywhere. Language plays many different roles for many different disciplines. I just mentioned a few here on this slide, you know, it's, uh, I'm not going to describe them all in detail, but you see it, it touches upon cultural heritage, upon history, sociology, anthropology, um, all disciplines when it comes down to preserving, disseminating knowledge, um, law, theology, uh, media studies, journalism, education, literary studies, psychology, brain studies, political sciences, language and speech technology, and also uh, linguistics and phonetics, of course. So you see many different communities um, make use of language in their daily research practice, and uh, I think that most of them could make use of the services offered by Clarion. Now, if we go through the uh, research life cycle, then um, we take some of the phases, the initial training phase where you, let's say, educated as a student, what does um, uh, Clarion offer there? Well, we have a course registry where you can find education opportunities. This is something we do together with Daria. And we have, um, we give video lectures. I'm sure that this lecture will be published on the Clarion website as well as soon as it's uh, finalized. Uh, we have summer school session workshops, tutorials, and um, we offer mobility grants to bring researchers and technical experts together. Um, if you look at the, the, the phase where you develop research questions and plan your research, what we do is we offer a huge catalog of, um, at this moment, 1.6 million language resources that, where, that people can browse in order to check whether the resources they need are available somewhere within or outside Clarion. We have a Clarion portal that offers showcases of, um, let's say, or use cases uh, where where people can show, where we show how digital methods are used in uh, specific uh, disciplines uh, to, uh, to serve a sort of um, source of inspiration for researchers who want to um, formulate the research questions. We have some very interesting uh, uh, collections of families of key resources that are relevant for many different disciplines like historical newspapers, parliamentary records, oral history recordings and social media. And we also provide best practice document on a variety of, to variety of topics, including uh, standards, usage use, and uh, the, 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 all the problems and possible solutions uh, with respect to IPR issues. Then um, if you uh, move on in the research life cycle, it's once you start carrying out your research, we offer very easy access to both um, open um, and protect protected uh, language data in all modalities. We have all sorts of web applications and tools that you can use to analyze your data, to visualize your data, and um, we have various search opportunities so that you can search across repositories uh, all over Europe for specific uh, items that you want to find. And we have um, thematic knowledge centers dedicated to uh, specific languages or specific technologies or data types where people can just um, get advice and support for their work. And then once you uh, want to publish your results, especially data resulting from your uh, project, um, we offer depositing services and uh, persistent identifiers to make sure that 
uh, even after 100 years, um, you can still uh, find the, the data that uh, you've been referring to in your publications. Then I want to, this was Clarion, and I want to emphasize that there is also a, a whole collection of invisible research infrastructures. I mentioned them already briefly earlier on, that really are the enablers for all our work. And that this is typically the, the academic networks. And um, because what they do is they offer the opportunity to, to research it, to um, communicate with each other. They allow us to, uh, to connect to the infrastructures, to, uh, they interconnect nodes of data networks. They help us to uh, connect infrastructure across uh, disciplines, which I think is very important. And they offer platforms for electronic publication of results and uh, for training and uh, education activities. And they are really crucial. If they didn't exist, we could not e exist either. And with these words, I hand over to, yeah, to. Yeah. Okay, I will. I will take over. <laughs> yep. Okay, and let let us come to 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 the last steps of our webinar. Uh, Ulrike, our host for today, gave me the signals that we have to hurry up a little bit. But but anyhow, we want to to give you some takeaway messages with you. And um, as we mentioned at the beginning, we um, see a lot of opportunities and challenges for research infrastructures. And we want to break it down to three actions and lines. Um, first, work on the development and implementation of courses aimed at digital literacy in SSH and CH curricula. That means that we have to think a lot more in the next years how we can integrate digital efforts in the curricula at the level of universities, for example. At the same time, we have to involve courses and classes for those already working as researchers or educators because uh, they have to be trained also. And the third aspect, and um, that's the main aspect for Stephen and, and me, um, we need to offer facilities and we need to offer uh, some technical back end and backgrounds for researchers and technical experts to team up and to work together on using digital data and tools and to address research questions. Because research questions changed during the last years a little bit and will change uh, in, in a stronger way during the next years because um, scholars in the arts and humanities and the cultural heritage will have new opportunities to handle data and larger data sets. And we want to know from you, and um, it will be for us maybe an introduction for our discussion later on, what do you think are the opportunities and challenges uh, of research infrastructures? If you like, just type it to the chat. Uh, Ulrike will collect it, and so we can start uh, to the discussion later on. But first, two final slides about take-home messages. Um, first, um, as Stephen said, Daria and Clarin are not the only research infrastructures uh, on the European level. We presented to you some others, and uh, a, a lot of research infrastructures exist on national level. So um, they are really doing a great job, and that's the second aspect. Um, maybe sometimes uh, a lot of people think, okay, they have a lot of overlaps and their activities are complementary to each other. Yes, and that's good because it's a research topic for all of us because we need to do research how research infrastructures and technical components can work in the futures. And we need a cross-discipline perspective to it. That's the second take home message. The third one our eyes are a joint venture of scholars, computer scientists, information experts, and representatives of galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Research infrastructures has always an interdisciplinary aspect and needed to, to run 
for the efforts of the arts and humanities. Fourth, there exists no question, either or. Research infrastructure supports researchers who work and research digitally, and that's fine. And it's not better or worse if you are not working on a digital level. It's also fine because we are all doing research and it does not matter how we are doing it. Fifth, um, and I mentioned it earlier, research infrastructures are tools for research projects. And at the same time, they are subject of research. So we are in the middle of a process. Nobody will get a finally working research infrastructure like a Microsoft software product and it will run the next 20 years and we don't have to think about how it will do. It is research. It's new. It's innovative. And um, we saw the last days a lot about a slogan for research infrastructures. And Stephen and I um, just found two days ago the slogan of the MIT. And in our opinion, generating, spreading, preserving knowledge and collaborating with each other. That is the main goal of research infrastructures in the social sciences and humanities. So thank you very much. And we are looking forward to the discussion. So please type a lot of questions. Thank you. And I will hand over to Ulrich again. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, very inspiring um, presentation. Um, I think there is a lot to think about and the chat is getting very active at the moment. Um, so I think the, the, the questions are just rolling in. And um, to answer one question already, we will make the presentation available um, later on. So no fear about that. Um, I will collect them from the speakers and uh, we will upload them to SlideShare and uh, also to um, HAL. So you also have the slides as a PowerPoint presentation. Um, yeah, so let's see for a question, see something. Um, I will put it um, also for you to see um, and just make it a bit bigger. I will move it into the screen in a second. Um, but just that you can read it. So here it comes. Um, there it, yeah, you should be able to see it. Um, so there came in um, something from Jeff. So I think that's. I hand over to Stefan and Stephen, and I will. Okay, Stephen, maybe I will start because Darius mentioned, um, but but it's also a question uh, for for every research infrastructure. Yes, I think uh, Jeff, you're totally right. It's hard work, and um, so we we started with Daria ten yeah around ten years ago. So it was a pre-project around two thousand eight. And officially, we started 2011. It's hard work to engage scholars and researchers. And um, so um, that, that is one reason why, why Stephen and I put training in the middle of the research circle. Because training, giving classes, um, establishing a contact point for questions um, is really important. And um, in our experience, um, it has, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a hard work to engage it because every single scholar has a different question and um, has a totally different intention why he or she is interested to, uh, to work more digital. And um, so um, it's a really important investment to, to, to uh, set up 
training, set up classes, set up summer schools, and at the same time go to the go to the different disciplinary approaches. Um, because um, in Germany, for example, we had uh, around 15 years ago the DQUIT initiative, and the DQUIT initiative uh, was especially a computing center, library, and computer science driven effort. And the issue was always that a lot of infrastructures were built up, and uh, after a while, everybody recognized, okay, nobody will use it or is using it. And the only initiative which uh, really um, focused from the begin, beginning on was TechSquid. And, um, and the, 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 the only chance, and that is a result why uh, TechSquid is still running today, uh, was a really close engagement with the scholars. Okay, Stefan, are you done? Or because okay, okay, yeah, 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 well, sorry, I, 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 I couldn't see it. But no, uh, thank you, Jeff, for this question. I think it's a very interesting question. I totally agree with you. But I have a question to you, because um, in my experience, when we uh, started Clarin, it was rel relatively easy for us to 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 find users from the, uh, the linguistics community because many of the people who started Clarin were actually linguists or uh, computational linguists and so f to my perception you find linguists at every street corner so it's very easy to reach them in order to uh, show them the, the benefits they could have from using Clarin but as soon as you go to other disciplines where language is interesting for example libraries they're all built on language I would say then it's very much harder to, to reach them but uh, do you have suggestions for things we could do in order to, for example, uh, reach out in a more effective way to, to libraries in order to, to um, first of all, make people working there aware of uh, what, what exists and also in order to establish more collaboration than we already have? I don't know, Jeff, whether you have a chance to... to to type in, you know, if you don't have any immediate ideas of, of things we could do, you can always uh, send us an email to uh, with suggestions. Because uh, I think, uh, let's say, opening up towards the libraries is, is uh, something that I would very much like to do in a systematic way. And we have connection with some university libraries, especially. But I think that um, in, in many respects, Clarin and, and Daria and libraries have many things in common, and they should be able to, to find each other in order to collaborate and in order to let uh, each other benefit from what uh, we all have to offer. Um, now, I, I see Daniela's question. Yes, creative quality, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, in access to research infrastructure, that's very important. And I think in, in in a sense, we as digital infrastructures um, have an advantage in that uh, very often uh, capacity or reachability is not a problem. Whereas if you are owner of a physical infrastructure, then uh, all these physical infrastructure have a limited capacity and very often people have to compete in order to get uh, beam time on the particle accelerators or whatever. And uh, uh, very often the, the research infrastructure is not in your own country. So you have to, to travel and spend maybe a couple of months uh, in another place. And that is costly. But in our case, I think uh, people can just uh, access uh, the, the Clarion and Daria infrastructures online and try to, to find all the information they need. So that's good, but I think, I still think that we should do more, as I call it, missionary work in order to reach out to people uh, to, to, to explain to them what we uh, can offer. And um, mm. Well, I, I see the challenge to maintain long-term accessibility. accessibility. Yeah, that's absolutely true because um, uh, the, the uh, long-term accessibility is always a challenge because if you look at the, the, the funding bodies who fund the research infrastructures, they are national governments. And uh, well, they, they, they very rarely want to commit themselves for uh, indefinite periods of time. They will just say, well, we're going to fund you for five years years uh, you can come back and then either you get something or you don't get anything I mean, that's uh, sort of lottery 
but we hope that also the funding authorities realize that sustainability of research infrastructure is really crucial in order to, to get a return on uh, the uh, investments they make on uh, setting up and uh, maintaining the infrastructures. And maybe let me add one aspect. Um, research in the arts and humanities does not know any borders. And so, uh, for example, in the DARIA context, we have a lot of research groups worldwide uh, working. So uh, may maybe some hosts in Europe, some hosts in, in the United States or in Northern uh, America. And um, that's an opportunity of digital research infrastructures because um, it is not important anymore where or when you are working on a topic. Um, just the opportunity exists to do so. And um, it's, it's always funny because um, when we're talking about researchers, we are not only talking about the level of universities or uh, academics on this level. We have a lot of uh, people who uh, have totally other jobs on which are interested in doing research in the arts and humanities in, in the kind of public science. And um, they can use this kind of research infrastructures too. And so that, that's an opportunity. And coming back to, to Jeff, yes, I think it's, it's a really important challenge. And um, in my opinion, it's really important to bring libraries, archives, universities, research uh, institutions um, to one table because uh, building up and running an infrastructure is a topic for all of them. That's by the way one reason why the consortium in Germany has all the different types of institutions in it because uh, you, you need if you want or you, you need partners like libraries if you're talking about long-term sustainability of data they can do it because they have done it the last hundreds of years, yeah. And um, it's the same for archives. And uh, it's an approach of all the institutions on an academic level. And so we have to talk and integrate libraries, archives, universities, research infrastructures, and by the way, also um, social communities like the Open Knowledge Foundation or like Wikipedia because they have new ways of dealing with data. Roger and out. Thank you very much. Um, that was a very interesting discussion. And uh, we're almost at the end. Um, I, I actually have a question. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer it, but uh, looking at this uh, very nice uh, sign language GIF, I started wondering um, what the hand is saying, if it was a Clarin or Hello World or something like that. But um, No, no, I, 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 I wish I knew, but uh, yeah, I, I don't. But next time I will use one where I know what the meaning is. And I'm sure that the problem with sign language is that uh, sign language is not opposed to what many people think uh, international. Every language has its own sign language. So even if some 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 uh, expression makes sense in, in in Dutch, it may not make sense in English or German or French or whatever, Can, or it could mean something totally different yeah. or even the opposite. We don't know. Yeah, and the funny aspect, you have some accents at the same time. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, not not only on national level. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Uh... We come to the closing words. I'm sorry for that, uh, to, but we want to keep it to one hour. Um, I will write a wrap up um, with uh, Stefan and Steven, so where we um, take up the question from the chat, we write a short summary, um, you will get the presentation, um, so you can look uh, at the slides um, and follow all the interesting links. and. We will also put online the webinar recording, but uh, be, um, bear with us. Uh, it might take some time, but I will be working on it and be as fast as possible. Now, what you can do for us 
is first of all um, fill in the feedback survey, give us an impression how you like the webinar. We have more coming up in April about um, developing research questions and about uh, analyzing um, data. So follow also our social media activities to learn when they will happen. And the last but not least for me is to thank Stefan and Steven for doing a great job and giving so much information and lots to think about and especially tackling the big question of uh, how to engage with users and how to engage between the different research infrastructures, analog and, and digital in the social sciences and humanities. But the last word is to the two of you. Well, thank, thank you, you Ulrike, for organizing this. I really enjoyed this uh, webinar. As I told you earlier on, this is my very first one, and I'm looking forward to the next one. And uh, I also would like to emphasize that if you would like, to, if you have some uh, additional questions and would like to contact us, you know where to find us, you know, and then uh, we will be happy to answer your questions, even if questions come up later on. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you very much for listening. And don't hesitate, if you have any further question, just contact us. And by the way, I really like Otto's Open Access Otter. It's a fascinating <laughs> 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 And um, I think one, one last word, um, not only research infrastructures, but also digital humanities are always a jointly collaboration of scholars, librarians, archivists, and um, we, we can ride the wave because it is part of our job. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you and goodbye to all the participants. We hope to see you back for the fourth edition. <laughs>